This is lecture one, two, which is all about the process of solvation and molarity. So here are the learning targets and they were also posted in the assignment. So you should have them finished before you begin watching the rest of this video. So make sure that you've done a really good job with these in your learning target notebook and then uh, just go ahead and keep going. So as long as you're ready, here we go. So the idea is, is that we, this whole unit is about reactions that occur in solution. So as we're looking at this, the, we need to talk about what happens as something dissolves, especially as something dissolves in water. So the process of solvation or the process of dissolving involves creating new interactions between what's being dissolved, the solute, and what it's being dissolved in, the solvent. But in order to do that, those interactions have to be stronger than the interactions that were in between the molecules of the solvent, so solvent to solvent molecules. In this case, that would be um, like the, the interactions in between the water molecules. And you can kind of represent them maybe um, as hydrogen bonding, and we'll talk about that later in the year, but they would be interactions like in between here that are holding the water molecules together to make it liquid water, right? We have to break those attractions and we have to form new attractions between whatever it is that's dissolving and the water molecules. So if this is an ionic compound, you can see that the negative end of the water, which would be the, wa the oxygen end, is going to be attracted to the positive cation, which would be the sodium. And so what happens is that the water comes in here and actually forms this attraction in there and wiggles its way in between the ions. So it has to be stronger than the attraction between the positive and negative ions and able to pull them apart like that. So basically what's happening is what was a solute to solute attraction in here between the positive and negative ions and a solvent to solvent attraction, which would have been these attractive forces in between water molecules, have to break and we end up with new attractions forming in between um, the solvent and the solute, which would be like what's going on here. Notice that basically those water molecules pivot around those ions and the negative end of the water molecule will be a, um, kind of completely around surrounding the positive ion and the positive end of the water molecule will be completely surrounding the negative ion and they form these little bunches. Um, you can kind of see those. So this is what happens when an ionic compound dissolves. When a molecular compound dissolves in water, it stays molecules. So what you can see here is this is one sugar, C12H22O11, and another, and another, and another. All those molecules are in a great big crystal of sugar. The same thing happens. You have to break the attraction between water molecules, you have to break the attraction between sugar molecules, and you have to form a new stronger attraction between the water and the sugar. So these would pivot themselves around so that the polar ends of the molecules that are negative would be attracted to the polar ends of the molecules that are positive, and vice versa. But what you can see is that the sugar molecule stays a molecule in the midst of all those water molecules. So that's really, really important. The difference is, is that ionic compounds, when they dissolve in water, form individual ions, and those are hydrated or surrounded by water. And when molecular compounds dissolve, the molecules stay intact and are surrounded by water. And the reason that oil and water cannot dissolve in each other is because oil is nonpolar and water is polar. And so the attraction that would form between them is not stronger than the attraction between one oil molecule and another oil molecule. And it's not stronger than the attraction between one water molecule and another water molecule. And so these stronger attractions remain in place. And so there's um, no, not a strong enough attraction in between these to form a new attraction and to have them dissolve. So now you're thinking about the conceptual idea of dissolving, probably at more depth and more level than you have in the past. Okay, so now we just need to switch gears and we're gonna talk about how we measure concentration. Uh, we're gonna talk about molarity, how molarity can be calculated a bunch of different ways, how you can find um, or how you can actually make a solution with a specific molarity and how you can use molarity as a conversion factor. 
So remember that molarity is a unit that means moles specifically of solute only in every one liter of solution. And this would be total solution volume. So that's important because um, the solute takes up space. And so you're not adding a liter of solvent. You are measuring a liter of the solution after it's already mixed. And so after these attractions have formed, then we have a total volume of one liter. And of course, it has to be moles of solute. So if you're given grams or you're measuring grams, you're doing conversions to moles using the mass off the periodic table. So a couple of quick examples. Um, you may be pretty comfortable with this already, but I'm gonna give you a few examples to add to your targets so that they're clear and you have them. So this example wants you to calculate the molarity if 6.97 grams of potassium iodide is dissolved in enough water to give you a total volume of 100 milliliters. So we're gonna need to um, end up with moles per liter. And that means that I'm gonna to have to convert my moles of solute, right? And in this case, the solute is the potassium iodide and liters of solution. And the total volume here is given in solution. So the 100 milliliters will be in the denominator, but we'll have to convert it to liters. And the 6.97 grams of potassium iodide will be in the numerator, but we have to convert it to moles. So if you'd like, uh, stop the video and try that and then check and see if you're correct. Okay, so I'm gonna set this up for you. Molarity equals moles of solute. So this would be, I'm gonna kind of do it all at once, 6.97 grams of Ki, and from the periodic table, I see 166.98 grams of Ki for every mole of Ki. And then I need this to be per liter of solution. And right now this is per, 100 with a decimal place milliliters of solution and so I'm going to come in here and I could do this in two separate steps and then divide if I'd rather but I'm going to come in here and um, convert milliliters of solution to liters of solution and again you could do this in two steps convert your grams to moles convert your milliliters to liters and then divide but I kind of like to do it like this one liter a thousand milliliters and after I do the math I get 0 0.0417415 a bunch of numbers which oops oh, sorry that's um decimals in the wrong place let me try that again I get um, 0 0.417415 and more numbers and this would now be um, milliliters cancel and grams cancel, and so this would be moles of Ki per liter of solution. So I'm gonna to round to three significant figures based on my given measurements. So that would be 0.417 molar potassium iodide. Okay, um, all right, let's try another one. This one is gonna ask you both to use molarity as a conversion factor and to calculate the molarity of the ions. So you explained how to do this for yourself in your learning targets. Uh, make sure that you have an example in there so that you can kind of see how this works. So I have um, a total volume of 1.32 liters of a solution that's 0.55 molar sodium phosphate. And they wanna know how many moles of each ion are in that volume. So um, I'm gonna use the molarity as a conversion factor here, which means I need to start with the volume, 1.32 liters of solution. And I need to get from liters of solution to moles of sodium phosphate, which would be Na3PO4. Sodium is one plus and phosphate is three minus. And from the molarity, this 0.55 molar means 0.55 moles per every liter. And so I could find the molarity of the sodium phosphate and go from there. Um, that would be approximately 0.73. That's after I've rounded it. Sorry, I rounded that too soon. I think it's um, 0.726, but um, we have 0.73 here, um, two significant figures from the molarity, moles of Na3PO4. Now I need to figure out how many moles of each ion. So 0.73 moles of Na3PO4 for every one mole of the whole compound, oops, Na3, sorry. There are three moles 
of Na plus ions. And so you should be able to see um, that. And so this question wants to know what amount in moles of each ion. So this is how we're going to set that up. So from the formula, then this would be um, 2.178. I think I used the original value that is not rounded there. But when I'm done, I'm still stuck with two significant figures, which comes down to 2.2 .2 moles of Na plus ions. And of course, the 0.73 moles of sodium phosphate. You can see that in sodium phosphate, there's one phosphate. So for every one mole of sodium phosphate, there's one mole of phosphate ions. And so um, I can see then that this would stay the same, 0.73 moles of phosphate ions. They, if they asked me, they didn't ask here, but if they asked me for the total, I would simply add them together to get the total number of moles of ions in solution. So, uh, hopefully that's helpful. You're going to use this a lot because when we're doing stoichiometry with solutions, you need to know the moles of the ion, not the moles of the compound that you put in. All right, so the other thing that we need to make sure that you're comfortable with is the lab piece of this, which would be preparing a solution from a salt or preparing a solution from a more concentrated solution. So we're going to talk about that piece of it in a second, um, the concentrated solution. But right now we're going to talk about how you would do this from a solid salt. So of course, you would have to determine the number of grams of solid needed to make whatever specific volume you are looking to make. So what happens is that if I'm making solutions for labs, sometimes I need to make 500 milliliters in my volumetric flask, or sometimes I need to make 100 milliliters in my volumetric flask, or maybe 250. So I have to use the calculations like I did up here to figure out the uh, moles of the whole solid and then convert it to grams. So that's always my first step. And then I put a little bit of water in the bottom of the flask. I add the solid and then I dissolve it completely and then I keep adding water and mixing it and adding and mixing and adding and mixing until the total volume equals the amount you plan to make. And we use something called a volumetric flask to do this which kind of looks like this. It's not really look like an Erlenmeyer, usually they're rounder, but there's only one line, and this is what we call a volumetric flask. So that one line is really exact, they're expensive, that one line is really exact to a specific volume. It might be a liter, it might be 500 milliliters, I have a little teeny baby one on my desk that I think is five milliliters. So they come in all different sizes and you have to make that volume if you're gonna use a volumetric flask. So let's do an example so that you can see this. We wanna prepare 57.5 milliliters, very unrealistic. There is no volumetric flask of this, so I'd have to use a graduated cylinder, and that would be really hard to mix in, um, but I could do it. So I wanna make 57.5 milliliters of a solution of chromium-3 nitrate that's 0 0.0015,3 molar. So I would have to figure out how many grams of chromium nitrate to use. I'm gonna start with the volume that I need, 57.5 milliliters of solution. And I'm gonna convert milliliters of solution to um, liters of solution, so 1,000 milliliters per liter. And then I'm gonna convert liters of solution to moles of the solute, which would be chromium-3 nitrate. So you have to get used to how to do this. This is going to be one liter and the molarity is 0 0.00153. So there would be that many moles of the solute. And then I need to get to grams. So moles of chromium-3 nitrate to grams of chromium-3 nitrate. I'm going to add that up off the periodic table and I got 238.03. And after I do that, I um, have to round to three significant figures from my molarity and my measured value, but I get 0 0.2094, which will then point, equal 0 0.209 grams. So if you were using the good balance in our room that goes to three decimals, you could actually measure this to three decimals. And you're going to use a graduated cylinder, yuck, and put some water in the bottom, and you're gonna put this so you'd have your graduated cylinder. All right, you're going to put some water in the bottom. You're going to put the 50 or sorry, the 0.209 grams in. 
And then you're gonna go until you get to 57.5 grams or five milliliters of water total um, and fill it up and mix it and fill it up and mix it. But the key is, is you put in this mass and add water to a total volume of 57.5 milliliters, okay? Um, so that's that piece. All right, two more things that we need to look at, concentrated versus dilute. Remember that concentrated and dilute are comparative terms. You can't look at one solution and make that description. You're really describing it in comparison to another. There are a couple different ways you can do this to dilute a solution or to make a solution more concentrated. Um, you could make a solution more dilute, this is the easy one, by adding solvent. It's really hard to remove solute. Usually you would have to react them out, pull them out as a precipitate, that's not very practical. Or you can make a solution more concentrated by adding solute, that's the easy one. Or by removing solvent, you'd have to evaporate the solvent. So you could do that to get it to a more concentrated volume that you want, evaporate it till you have whatever total volume you're looking for. But typically the way that we use this is we purchase what we call stock solutions, which are concentrated. So I buy 12 molar concentrated hydrochloric acid, and then when I need one molar or half molar for the lab, I figure out how to make that solution, right? So you can see here that the biggest difference in a dilute solution is that there is way, way, way more solvent than there is in a concentrated solution, okay? All right, so um, these calculations that we use, we use this formula that's been shortened, um, which is, called the dilution formula, which is the molarity of one times its volume and the molarity of the other times its volume. So usually I make one side the concentrated and the other side the dilute. And it doesn't matter which side is which. But the only reason that this works is because if you're diluting a solution, like let's say I have this beaker on the left and I wanna dilute it to the, make it look like the beaker on the right, I'm not changing the number of moles of solute moles of solute remain the same. This is important. The only thing that changes is the volume of the solvent. I just added water. So this means that I can not have to do a whole bunch of conversions to moles and then find what I need in the new volume and convert back out to volume. I can use this shortcut formula. Okay, so, um, so let's practice. A chemist dilutes 60 milliliters of 4.5 molar potassium permanganate to make, and I'm gonna write the formula for that even though I don't really need it. Um, permanganate is MnO4 one minus and K plus, okay? To make a 1.25 molar solution. So we're starting with um, this, which is our concentrate. And we wanna make, oops, sorry. We wanna make this, which is our dilute. And they wanna know what is the final volume of the dilute. So this is kind of weird. We don't usually make it this way. This is like adding um, water until we think it's gonna be 1.25 molar. But actually, um, this is how I would do this in the lab. If I wanted to make 1.25 molar to use in the lab, um, usually I'd figure out the volume and then uh, that I need and then go figure out the volume of the concentrate I would use. But we'll do that in a second. So in this case, we've got M1V1 equals M2V2, which I know I need because this is a dilution calculation. And the concentrated, I can leave it in milliliters if I'd like because it's gonna be the same on both sides. So the concentrated would be 60.0 milliliters times its molarity, sorry, I did volume first which is 4.50 molar. Technically, this is the molarity and this is the volume, all right? And I wanna make 1.25 molar solution, so I'm looking for the volume of the dilute that I'll be able to make. So this is now simple algebra, and I can see that the volume I would be able to make would be 216, I have three sig figs, milliliters of dilute, which would be 1.25 molar solution. Okay? All right, now let's talk about preparing a solution from a more concentrated solution, just like we've prepared our solution up here from the solid salt. I do this all the time in the lab. If I need 50 milliliters or 500 milliliters of uh, 
diluted solution. I you figure out how much concentrate I would need. And this is going to be using um, the the M1V1 formula. Sorry, I lost my train of thought for a second. Um, and we're going to do that first. And then we use the same process. We put some water in the bottom of the flask that has the right marking that I need. I add the concentrated solution and mix completely. Then I add more water until the total volume equals the amount that I planned to make when I was calculating up here. Okay, so let's practice. I would like to prepare 5,800 milliliters. This is a huge amount. I would need a bucket to do this, but it'd have to have a bucket with lines on it that give me 5,800 milliliters. And I want 1.45 molar ammonium nitrate, but what's in my cupboard is 2.50 molar ammonium nitrate. So I'm going to compare those two and recognize that this is concentrated and this is dilute. So I want to know how to solve for this, how to make this solution, which means I need to know how much of, whoops, sorry, how much of the concentrate is needed. And I'm going to put it in the bottom of the bucket and add water till I get to 5,800 milliliters. So I'm using my formula, M1V1 equals M2V2. My um, dilute would be I need 1.45 molar and I'm going to make 5,800 milliliters and my concentrate would be 2.50 molar and I need to know how much to use. So I set this up and I solve that the volume of the concentrate that's needed would be 3,364 milliliters. Now here's where we come down to a real problem with significant figures. Technically I only have two, which means I wouldn't really mix the solution unless I use that and ignore significant figures. If I'm going to include significant figures, this would have to be 3,400 milliliters. And this is saying I'm going to measure 3,400 milliliters of my concentrate, which is 2.50 molar ammonium nitrate. I'm going to pour it into the bucket. I'm going to put a little bit of water in the bottom first. That's usually good practice, especially if you're adding acid to water. Um, I'm going to add water and mix to a total, oops, total volume of 5,800 milliliters. So this is how you do those calculations and how you figure that process out. Okay, so let's see where we're at. I'm pretty sure that everything that you might have found confusing uh, has been covered from your learning targets and uh, maybe a little bit more depth, some things that you hadn't thought of. So please make sure that you come to class with these learning targets, ready to use them and ready to ask questions if you have them. Thank you.